this morning. This is Richard Organ versus Patricia Organ. case that involved a three-tier structure for spousal support. The first tier was based on Mr. Organ's base salary at the time of the divorce, which was $400,000. This goes without dispute. The second tier was that he was any, that he was required to provide as further spousal support to Mrs. Organ, 50% of any bonus that he received. The third tier... Which he did pay to her, correct? Yes, and that's not disputed, Your Honor. Uh, the third tier was that he, during the pendency of the case, if you will, had changed jobs, had purchased some stock in the new company that he uh, was then employed, and the court for the third tier um, required him to pay 33 and a third percent of any appreciation of that stock when it was sold, which he did comply with also. The reason that his, the predominant reason that his income was so high was that he was involved in a sale uh, during the marriage of this particular company, and all of that income was included in tax returns and so on and so forth. He then was hired by another company uh, at, the, at the rate of $400,000 per year. He was involuntarily terminated from that company, and in the termination, uh, he was awarded one year severance at the rate of $400,000 uh, for one more year. The motion to modify was not to take effect until after that full year's severance had been exhausted. And it was filed right before the exhaustion of that one year remedy. It is undisputed that he is still required to pay 50% of bonuses under Tier 2, and he is still required to pay the one-third that he makes on any appreciation of stock of any company in which he is involved. What we have is whether or not a reduction of Tier 1, which is from $400,000 to $150,000, is a substantial change of circumstance. And of course, it is also undisputed that the court reserved jurisdiction to modify spousal support. This was a 62% reduction uh, in his salary. And we believe that that is a, an abuse of discretion in not finding that this particular reduction was substantial. Cases that I have cited in my brief, I didn't have to look too hard on the research because I was involved in both cases. The first was the Simcox case, where Mr. Simcox had um, received a 60% reduction uh, of his um, salary, if you will, and um, this court held that that was substantial reduction. The second case that I cited was the Schumacher case, of which I was on the receiving end of a substantial reduction. And Mr. Schumacher had a 50% reduction uh, of 
his uh, salary. Uh, and the court found that that was substantial. And both those cases were reversed uh, when the court found that there was no uh, substantial uh, reduction in pay. Where I believe that the trial court lost its way is that they included any tier two or two tier three spousal support uh, as was the evidence from his total income, which was undisputed that he had already given her. That's number one. Number two, the court also included a substantial portion of his income that reflected his investment income. In the court's initial di divorce case, the court specifically found that because both parties had equally divided marital assets and both had received in round numbers $5 million, that their investment income would be about the same. And as a result of that, was not including what Mrs. Morgan could get on a rate of return on $5 million. Mr. Morgan took issue with that and filed a notice of appeal in this court saying that the court should have considered the investment income that Mrs. Morgan received. Um, I, yes, it, the, the investment income that Mrs. Morgan had received in the alimony order. This court specifically ruled on page 9 of Organ 1, which I've cited in my brief, that because the court found that it was relatively equal, that it was not an abuse of discretion for the court not to include the investment income of the parties. What this particular trial judge did was she all of a sudden did include his investment income without even addressing that she still has her $5 million um, of investment income. We think that that was totally improper. Uh, if the court wouldn't find in this case that a 62% uh, reduction of his uh, income is substantial, then there is no uh, such criteria that this court could could possibly uh, uh, could could possibly uh, uh, find as a uh, uh, substantial change of of income. Um, when the court did make that determination, was did she have any investment income of her own that was included in the new spouse's work calculation? No. Oh, sure, and it, she testified that she had still $5 million even after she purchased a condominium in, in Chicago for a million dollars round numbers. So there was testimony, there was evidence of money that she made off of her investments as well. Yes, the, she still had this $5 million. At the original, at the original trial, and judge and the trial judge in the original trial reflected the fact that Mr. Organ did retain an expert to show that she could, um, on this five million dollars that she received, uh, receive about seven and seven point three percent return on that uh, five million dollars, which is around numbers again around three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. But right now, what Mr. Organ is paying is 108% in spousal support on tier one of his income. That's unreasonable. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. It's still morning, I guess. Uh, I'm Kenneth Gibson on behalf of the appellee in this case. Uh, Mr. Grissy is correct that the uh, trial court originally uh, set forth uh, a three-tier spousal support. Um, and that was based upon 
the husband's employment at the time that involved both bonuses and uh, incentive stock and programs. Uh, by the time he filed his motion for uh, modification of spousal support, he had changed jobs. He had structured his compensation, or the new company had, I don't know that it was his choice, but the new company had structured his compensation in a completely different manner. Uh, there is, There was no testimony, I mean, yes, he was supposed to uh, pay her 50% of any gross bonuses going forward. There was no testimony that there were going to be any such gross bonuses. There was no testimony that he continued to participate in a stock incentive plan unless you determine that his percentage of the fund that he was in charge of as an investment was somehow a stock incentive plan, but he didn't actually own stock in that. He was going to get a percentage, a half a percent uh, of $350 million plus uh, whatever growth there was on it uh, when he uh, uh, completed, when that fund closed. But that was all subsequent to the divorce. Oh, sure. But, but it would be income for spouse support purposes. Mm -hmm. So, what happened is the, the trial court recognized and this court recognized that his income greatly fluctuated. He'd go for, for years at around a million dollars and then he might get 10 million. And the, the trial court recognized that his income fluctuated uh, greatly uh, just because of the nature of his business. He's in charge of turning around businesses and instead of actually owning stock in a business and then getting his income when it's sold, he now manages a fund that invests in these businesses and the fund is the owner of the stock and therefore he doesn't have stock incentives, so to speak. He just gets a percentage of the growth of the fund. What essentially the appellant is arguing is that you should consider only one portion of his income for purposes of determining whether spousal support should be modified. And this court has repeatedly held, and the statute clearly states, that you must consider all of his income in deciding whether or not he has met his burden of showing a change of circumstances, justifying a modification of spouse support. In fact, you must not only consider all of his actual income, but his earning capacity and all the other spousal support factors which this court recited uh, in its earlier decision uh, greatly supported spousal support in this case. So, you know, to say that, oh, we're going to divorce out a little small piece of his income comprising, I mean, he says 150000 yet his tax return shows $1.1 million worth of income, so that 150000 was a very small part of his income. Ignore all the rest. Well, that's not, that's not the way the statute reads. That's not what the case law says. There is, uh, in that, I'm sorry, the court found that his income had not substantially changed over the uh, prior years. The court looked back at his 2012, his 2013, his 2014 and his 2015 federal income tax returns and found that his average income in those years was $1,031,778. And the court looked at the uh, tax return uh, and determined that his current income was one million one hundred thousand and some dollars. Noting on that tax return, uh, less than a hundred thousand dollars of that represented dividends and, and capital gain. I'm sorry, dividends and interest. So, you know that that decision would not have been different if you excluded that portion of his income. 
the wife's income uh, from her investments was in the record because she filed her tax returns as exhibits, uh, and she did have substantial uh, income uh, from the uh, capital gains. I'm sorry, from the uh, dividends and interest, which was actually slightly higher than his, but not not significant. Ultimately, the trial court's decision is reviewed by this court for an abuse of discretion. Husband's actual income had not substantially changed. His earning capacity had not changed. Wife's health had deteriorated, but all the other factors supporting a substantial award of spousal support were unchanged. And the trial court, in its discretion, determined that the husband had not met his burden of showing a substantial change of circumstances. This is not a case where there was a separation agreement and the parties had an agreement on this three-tier spousal support. This was a court order. The court reserved jurisdiction to modify it. And uh, the court's decision uh, in this case was uh, both reasonable and correct. I think I've addressed all of the issues. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, all right. Thank you. The structure changed in as much as he got a percentage of the stock incentive plan. He's still responsible to pay that out if he ever receives it in accordance with the court's order. That would be under tier three. I don't think that she would be entitled to any monies out of that stock and center program if he didn't receive any money from that stock and center program. And if he didn't receive any bonuses, he doesn't have the he doesn't receive the money. He certainly would, I'm sure, would like a bonus because despite the fact that he has to give half to her, he gets the other half. So if there are no bonuses, under tier two, well then she doesn't get tier two, but if tier three is such that he's potentially going to get a lot of money, she still shares in that. Now when they talk about percentages of income, they were talking about three million, two million, one million. She has gotten her share of each one of those and from the average being that counsel brought it up, from at the time of the divorce was an average of $3 million a year. Now when you take the four-year average, it's $1 million a year. That's still a 71% decrease in his total income or salary. It is the court under 3105.18, I agree with learned counsel that normally spousal support is considered from any and all sources. In this particular case, the trial court said that they were not going to consider investment income and said so on page 12 of their findings when they found that our expert conceded that he would get about the same as she would for investment income. And then in rule on page 28 and 29 of the court's original order, they didn't mention anything about that. Now, evidently, the trial court missed this court's finding when, on page 9 of this court's finding, when they said she didn't have to consider this investment income. But now, all of a sudden, despite this court's ruling in the earlier Oregon case, now, all of a sudden, his investment income is, is being utilized. Um, no one is disputing that if he gets more bonuses, she gets half. 
No one is disputing that if he gets some percentage of the value and appreciation of stock through his employment, that she's going to get a percentage of that. That's tours, tiers two and tiers three. It is this first segment that is grossly unfair with him paying more than 100% of what he is receiving. And if she gets a couple of million dollars down the road because he took less now, the company said, I'll pay you less now and you may have an opportunity down the road, She's getting 108% of what he gets now. She's still going to get her percentage if it ever comes to pass, and he receives some additional monies for the appreciation of this stock. Thank you. Thank you both for the presentation today. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision to be posted to our website. That is the report. We have both sides of the Thank you, Ron. Thank you.